When we talk about God, we sometimes think about Him in terms of the names and titles that He's given Himself or that we are find in Scripture as given to Him by those who trusted in Him. So, we think about some of the titles that are given to the Father. And often in books of theology, you'll find the same thing done with the Lord Jesus. His work will be expounded in terms of the titles He's given. He is the prophet, the priest, the king. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. He's the Son of Man, and so on and so forth. We don't so often think about the Holy Spirit in those terms, but we can think about Him in the same way. And actually, although you may not have noticed it in our previous studies, we've been thinking about a whole series of titles that we could give to the Holy Spirit. We could say He is the Creator Spirit, and uh, some of the hymns of the Christian church, some of the Latin hymns, express that fact, veni Creator Spiritus, come, Holy Spirit, come. And we've also thought about the Holy Spirit as the recreator, the one who brings order into our disorder, the one who gives fullness where we are empty. He is creator and He is recreator. And we've actually spent quite a lot of time thinking about the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in different ways, we've seen how it's His relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and the revelation that the Lord Jesus gives to us of the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand our relationship to the Spirit and His ministry in us. So that Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, which I guess every Sunday I pronounce several times to my congregation, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship or communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The communion of the Holy Spirit, that we should know Him, that we should love Him. And uh, in order to know and love people, we need to know who they are, and we give them descriptions and titles. And this is true of the Holy Spirit. Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit in the farewell discourse as the divine paraclete, the one whom He calls alongside us to be our helper. So, that's another title for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the helper. But there's a title that I've now used several times in the last two minutes that we haven't discussed. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit. What do we mean when we say that the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Well, we mean that in Himself He is holy. He shares in the infinite holiness of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, in fact, when we reflect on those words in Isaiah chapter 6 that are picked up in the heavenly praise in the book of Revelation, we think about them in terms of the divine trinity, the Holy Father, the Holy Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is in Himself holy, and therefore it follows that those who live in communion with Him also must be holy. Not only that, but the great ministry of the Holy Spirit, as we've already had hints, is that He takes our disordered lives in our fallenness, in our sinfulness, and He recreates us so that He is sent by the Lord Jesus into our lives in order to work holiness into our lives. And in this session, I want us to look at a passage at the beginning of Romans chapter 8, but particularly at one verse in Romans chapter 8 that expresses this notion that the Spirit of the Lord is given to us in order to create holiness in us. Paul speaks to the Roman Christians. You remember how in chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, he's been speaking about the, the struggle that arises in the Christian life. Christ dwells in us by faith, and yet sin continues to dwell in us. And so long as these two realities are true for us, there is bound to be 
tension in the Christian life. There is bound to be conflict in the Christian life. And Paul expresses something of that conflict when he says, in myself I am a wretched man, but thank God Jesus Christ can deliver me. And then he goes on to explain in Romans chapter 3 how in the present life, although we are not yet perfect, the Holy Spirit enables us to grow in holiness and eventually also in Christ-likeness. God has sent His Son for our salvation, and now He sends His Holy Spirit for our sanctification. And so He encourages us to set our minds not on the flesh, but on the Spirit, because we are no longer in the flesh in the sense of being dominated by the flesh, but we've been brought into union and communion with Christ, and we live in the Spirit. So, says Paul, you remember to the Galatians, if we are living in the Spirit, then let's walk by the Spirit. But he's not forgotten that we remain sinners. And so, here in chapter 8 and verses 12 and 13, he says this, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led this way by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now, you see the importance of that last statement, and we will return to it in the future. We are sons of God we are children of God. And if we belong to that family, then it follows necessarily that we should live in a manner that's in keeping with that family. When uh, your children are young and uh, they're taking their first steps of independence on their own, perhaps they're going to a friend's house and uh, you quietly take them aside, and you say to them, now, if they're in my family, remember, you're a Ferguson. We're not sure how those Smiths or Joneses behave in their home and family and the kind of things they do, but you remember where you're from. You belong to us. So, live as a member of this family, no matter what other family you find yourself in company with. And this is what Paul is saying here. He is saying, now, you're sons of God and you're those who have been given the Spirit of God, so live as those who are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And one of the things that means is that you will constantly be putting to death the things that don't belong to your new family lifestyle. And it's one of the interesting things about this statement, actually it's fairly characteristic of the Apostle Paul, that he, he makes these statements and uh, you want to kind of draw him back and say, it's all very well for you to make these statements, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live, but you don't seem to explain to me how I'm supposed to be able to do this. I find when I begin to ask that question, what I need to do is keep my head down in my Bible, meditate on the verses that surround such a statement, and I think you invariably find when you do that, that although the Apostle Paul doesn't say, now there are four things here you need to do, you'll find in the context in which he's teaching and the things in which he's saying that he not only exhorts you to live in a certain way, but He shows you the resources God has given to you to enable you to live in that way. So, I sometimes say we have a tendency in the modern Christian world to go to the Bible to find out what we're to do, and then to go to the local Christian bookstore to discover how we're supposed to be able to do it. We don't expect to find the how-to questions answered in the Bible, but they are answered in the Bible. If the answers are not to be found in the Bible, they're not very reliable answers. So, Paul, teach me how it is that through the Spirit I'm able to put to death the deeds of the body. 
I think there are three things here to notice. Uh, that's actually not completely true. There are 11 things here to notice, <laughs> but I'm going to try and simplify them by focusing on three particular things. First of all, and I hope your mathematics and my arithmetic are up to this, first of all, the Spirit of God begins to create in us a sense of four things that help us to put sin to death in our lives. The first is this. It's a very obvious one. We need to do it. That's one of the things he's been emphasizing right from the very beginning of Romans, isn't it? That we are by nature sinners. We now have Christ indwelling us. And if Christ is indwelling us, it's absolutely inappropriate that we should continue to live in the same old way. That fact itself that Paul has been teaching us underscores for us we do need to get rid of sin. We do need to do it to death. Second thing is this. He's been teaching us, and this is particularly obvious back there in Romans chapter 6, that we are able to do that. You remember his teaching in Romans 6? He says, you've been united to Christ so that you have died to the dominion of sin and you've been raised into a new kingdom altogether where grace reigns. And he's saying, now, I wonder if you ever find this. You, you know, you often meet Christians who, who sense that sin is so powerful, I'll never be able to overcome it. And Paul's teaching is this, dear friend, if you're a Christian, you've already died to the dominion of sin. It no longer reigns over you. It's still present in you. But because it no longer reigns over you, it is possible for you to live by the Holy Spirit in such a way that you keep on saying no to sin. There's a third thing here that he's saying as he speaks about the sense that the Spirit creates in us, and, and that is that we are actually responsible to do it. If you, by the Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Do you, do you see the point here? The point is that the ministry of the Spirit doesn't reduce my responsibility to be obedient to the Lord but energizes me to fulfill that responsibility. He puts it in other terms in Philippians 2, 12 to 13. He says, work out your salvation into the whole of your life and into the whole of your fellowship because God by the Spirit is constantly working in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So, we need to do it we're able to do it by the Spirit. We're responsible to do it. The other thing he assumes is we actually want to do it. But that's what the Spirit creates in us, a desire to be like Christ and no longer to be what we once were. So, the Spirit creates in us this general sense of who we are and what we are called to be. The second big thing the Spirit does is He creates motives within us that make us want to live righteously and in a holy fashion and no longer according to our old lifestyle. And He pinpoints this in verse 13 of Romans 8 by saying, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Very simple principle, isn't it? that we reap exactly what we sow. We sow a thought, we reap an action. We sow an action, we reap a character. We sow a character, we reap a life. We sow a life, we reap a destiny. Do you know if you're a pastor, from time to time you experience people coming into your office they sit before you with their head in their hands because they have, they have messed up their lives in a major way, and very often they will say, I don't know how I could have done it. 
And it wouldn't be the appropriate thing at that point to tell them how they did it. But you know how they did it. You know that they did it because they looked at present experience rather than fixing their gaze on final destiny. And that's one of the great differences that the Holy Spirit effects in our lives. That's what He is urging in us. And especially, of course, when we are tempted, that we don't look at the short term, but that we look at the short term in the light of the long term that we look at the small in the light of the great, that we look at our sin in the light of eternity. And because Paul is teaching us, this is what the Holy Spirit effects in us, actually revolutionizes the way we look at things. I had a colleague who once, uh, beginning of every school year with an incoming class in seminary, in practical theology, would go into the room with the new students eager to learn practical theology, and he would say, I'm going to give you an exercise before I say anything to you. Take out a clean sheet of paper, and I want, I'm going to leave the room, and in the next 40 minutes, I want you to write your obituary notice. You know, I didn't come to seminary to die, <laughs> write my obituary, but you see what he was doing. He was teaching them right from the beginning that all practical theology involves looking at the present in the light of your eternal destiny. And that's one of the things that the Spirit effects in us as a, as a motive, so that we begin to see the visible in the light of the invisible. We begin to see time in the light of eternity begin to see all of our actions in the light of the final harvest. That's the Spirit's ministry. There's another thing here as the Spirit provides us with motives for holiness, and it's this. It's the simple principle that He's enunciated in the first four verses of Romans chapter 8, that Christ died for our sins. How then can we live either for them or to them? Remember how Jesus had said, when the Spirit comes, He's not going to glorify Himself, He's going to glorify me. And among the many things that means is that the Spirit of the Lord Jesus shines His spotlight on the Lord Jesus and especially on the fact that He came to die for my sins. And therefore, how radically inconsistent it is that if He came to die for my sins, that I should go on living for my sins. Every time I stumble and fall and make wrong choices, it's because I've grieved the Holy Spirit. Remember Paul's words in Ephesians 4.30? I've resisted the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in effect, I've said, it doesn't matter to me, Lord Jesus, that you died for this sin. I will continue to choose it. Now, that's unthinkable. That's such a contradiction of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it's a marvelous motive for us to leave our sinful lifestyle. And then there's another thing here. The Spirit creates in us this general sense of things. The Spirit provides for us these motives. We reap what we sow, and if we sow to the Spirit we'll reap the harvest of eternal life. We look at the cross and we say, Lord Jesus, if you've died for that sin, I will not embrace it. And then there's this, that the Spirit of God who dwells in you and unites you to the Lord Jesus Christ is a Spirit of holiness. Look at what he says in verses 9 through 11. You're no longer in the flesh, dominated by the flesh. You're in the Spirit, dominated by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. And if the Spirit of Christ doesn't dwell in you, then you're not a Christian. But if Christ dwells in you, even although the body is dead because of the sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then that same Spirit will give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in us. Think what Spirit dwells within you. 
He is the Holy Spirit who unites me to Christ. Let me tease that out just a little by a, a remarkable piece of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's, uh, it's one of those passages that, that one almost hesitates to read in, in church because it deals with such sensitive and offensive things. But there was great disorder in Corinth. You know that there was a verb created on the basis of the Corinthian lifestyle. To Corinthianize meant to live in an immoral way with sexual license. And so, when Paul speaks to the Corinthians, he has this astonishing thing to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15, do you not know that your very bodies are members of Christ? If you, if you belong to Christ, all of you belongs to Christ. Not some disembodied soul that belongs to Christ. You, as a being, belong to Christ, body and soul. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? And then he says this, what on earth could he have been thinking about? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, therefore flee from sexual immorality. Now, he's bringing to bear a great principle on a particularly offensive sin. Let me put it as graphically as I can. Here is a Christian believer going into the brothel, and it's not possible for him to say, Jesus, just stay outside my life while I'm in there, because he's joined to Jesus. And so, to all intents and purposes, he's dragging the Son of God down into the brothel with him. She wouldn't think of doing that, but that's exactly what you're doing, because whoever has been joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, who he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with Him. I think that word spirit should have a capital there. Jesus shares His Holy Spirit with us. We share the Holy Spirit of Jesus. And if that's true and it becomes a, a conscious and a subconscious reality in our lives, then by God's grace, the Spirit will work to help us to flee from sin and to live lives of holiness. So, says Paul, if through the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Quite a challenge, isn't it, as we think about our, our sins, the affections that go astray, the temptations, perhaps the particular temptations that we face. But when the Spirit points us to the Lord Jesus, and when the Spirit illumines our minds so that we say to ourselves, but I am united to my Lord Jesus Christ, then God has given us by His Spirit the great motivations to put sin to death. I hope by God's grace we may grow in that lifestyle. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're very conscious of our own sinfulness and our need and frailty and the ways in which we give way to temptation. We recognize that there is a law of gravity at work within our hearts, but we thank You that there are laws of the Spirit that enable us to overcome the law of gravity and to live in a holy fashion for the praise and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that You would help us by Your grace so to live that we may not grieve Your Holy Spirit by whom we were sealed for the final day of our salvation. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.